Hi, welcome back to Lakeside Quilt Making Arts. I am second guessing the fact that I got on the floor to do this. I don't get on the floor and move around very fluidly. It is always a trial, but I thought it was the best place to stretch out this quilt. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. And afterwards, uh, this is not gonna take very long. We're gonna work on coloring up Motor Block Heads 5, Group 2, Block 16. Now I have forgotten the name already, but I know it's got a little star inside of a star. And I'm intrigued to do it. I have not done any work yet on coloring it up. So this is what I want to talk about. You may have noticed that I, when I did the Eclipse video, I was sitting on a sunbonnet, sunbonnet Sioux quilt. This was something that I was going to talk about at some point, but when I turned on my phone this morning and I hopped over to the quilt show to see what their latest show was all about, and it was Mary Kerr, K-E-R-R. -R. I didn't know the name and I didn't know what she was up to, but if you've been around for a while, you might already have known about her. But I thought it was very fortuitous that they were talking about something that was on my mind because of this quilt. And this is a hand-pieced, hand applique. It's raw edge applique, by the way. Um, which is quite interesting. So I got this from a girlfriend. This is a friend uh, that uh, we have been um, best of buds for 37 years now. And this was, so she's my age and thereabouts. And this was her great grandmother's. So that puts, and I didn't ask her for the date of her grandmother because it's kind of, um, kind of irrelevant, but, but, her grandmother would have been born somewhere around the late 1800s, or her great-grandmother, I'm sorry, would have been born somewhere around the late 1800s or early 1900s. And that means that this would have been made somewhere probably in the 1920s or beyond. So I went online and I did a little bit of research to find out about the um, Sun Bonnet Sioux. And I guess in the South, it was known a little bit more as Dutch Girl. It came about because in the year 1900, there was a book called um, Sun, Sun Bonnet Babies, and they were faceless little girls with uh, bonnets. Kind of looks like that, doesn't it? And then I guess in 1911, I went to several different websites to learn all this, guys. Um, I did not already have this knowledge. I'm trying to make sure I show these all to you. Um, some are in better shape than others. This one. You can tell, you know, it's it's got some issues. So in 1911 is when mm, Ladies Home Journal, one of the big publications that existed at that time, they released an applique pattern, but it didn't really make it into the mainstream of the public uh, for quilt making until 1920. And then it was something that was done in the 20s and 30s. This one's not too bad. I think they're pretty adorable. I uh, can see why somebody would choose them. They're pretty simple um, applique pieces. That might be machine stitched. That applique, that that uh, is a zigzag stitch. No, it doesn't look uniform enough. I'll get the camera on this so that y'all can take a look at it too. The quilting is definitely hand done. My friend is one of four children and none of them wanted it. Um, so. They weren't because they don't have they don't have any you know it's tattered as you may not can tell from what I've shown you so far but there's parts of it's pretty tattered you know and I am a quilter and I don't know what to do with it so Mary Kerr coming onto the quilt show this morning was just very fortuitous so Mary has um, Mary has a few different books and she's also part of the uh, Quilts for Valor program, and she's got a book out called Quilts for Valor, and they showed some of that on the show today, too. And it was inspiring. Uh, and I did not realize that like I could make a Quilts for Valor for my uncle and then donate it to Quilts for Valor, and then they could be the one that bestowed it on him, and then he could have that great honor. I think I may have to do that at some point because I'm proud of his service. And there's probably a couple of other people that I'm proud of too that I might, I just might have to make that happen. Anyway, so all the little sunbonnet sues are pretty precious. 
But now I have this quilt that, you know, whenever I wanted to go out to the pier on the eclipse day, it was an easy grab because it was sitting on top of my washer. And so I just grabbed it. I thought, well, I can't ruin it because it's, you know, by sitting on that pier. And, um, you know, I thought, well, you know, I can't run it. So I'll just grab it really quickly because I wanted something easy. And it was perfect. It was fine for that. I did cushion the 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 pier. And then it was good for Zoe to lie on. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I've got some video of her lying on this. So what I learned by watching Mary today is that you get to be really creative. When you get a quilt like this, you get to be really creative about what, about what you do with it. You know, you get to cherry pick out the pieces that are in good shape. Um, and then get creative about how you repurpose it. Now, generally, whenever you're hearing someone talk about repurposing an old vintage quilt, they're thinking about turning it into clothing. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm certainly not going to do that with a sunbonnet sue. I just don't see myself walking around with a sunbonnet sue on my back or on my pant leg or, you know, the front of my shirt or whatever. You know, it's a very wide sashing. So what do I do with it? I, I don't know right now, but that's one of the things I wanted to bring up. Now, let me get closer so you can see. See how tattered all the edges are? Because back then, they didn't really bind. They just made them more like, um, oh, what would you call that? Um, I don't know if it's called facing. It's not called facing. It's just a turned edge. Instead of, oh, I know what it was. They called it birthing instead of binding. So in other words, it's um, sewn together with front sides to front sides with the batting in between and then with a little bit of an opening, just like when you're making like a pillow enclosure or something left open and then you turn the whole thing out so that all of your edges are just um, sewn from the inside. Well, that's not what happened here. This is this actually has the backing is turned over to the front and then stitched down. So that's just looks like just one layer. Yeah, that's just one layer, which is going to wear pretty quickly. I have heard recently someone say, I forget who it was. I don't know if it's Ricky or if it's somebody else. Uh, Ricky Timms, I mean, I don't know who it was for certain, but they had said that. Um, it doesn't matter if you do a single layer of binding or two layers of binding, that the binding needs to be replaced when it gets tattered. It kind of makes a lot of sense. But is it always going to get replaced? So if you have two layers of binding, which most of us do these days, you know, you have a double layer, you fold your two and a half inch strip into half, and then um, you lay it over the, the front and the back, then, you know, you've got one layer that if it gets ruined, you're not down, the, you're not seeing the edges of the front and back pieces of fabric of the quilt top or the uh, quilt back are not poking through that frayed edge because you've got another layer of binding. You've got to go all the way through two layers of binding before you do get down to that edge. Because as you see, you get down to the point where you're seeing the edges of the front and the back of your quilt. It starts getting really frayed pretty quickly and your batting starts pulling out. I was inspecting that batting. It looks like it's just really soft cotton. It looks pretty loose. Um, you see that? It's, it's um, not the kind of pressed cotton that my all 100% um, cotton battings are made out of these days. So I don't know what that would have been. So let's look at them. You can see the quilting. A little bit easier on the back. This area where it looks like it's, um, this area where it looks like there's no uh, quilting, there was at one time, I can tell from the front, that there had been stitching there. It's just come out. Okay, you can also see where some of the fabric is really, really worn. And this brings up another question I have when you start to thinking about repurposing quilts. When... My nephew, Asher, not the one who this is for, but the, and they're both great nephews. 
but when he was here initially last summer when we were going to start his quilt we were looking through my fabric stashes and trying to figure out you know what he might do and um we pulled out a black fabric that had been in my quilt bag and in storage since the 90s and so it'd been in the heat and whatever and i'm pretty sure it was dry rotted because we thought oh we should wash all this before we get started it completely disintegrated in the washer completely like there was no threads left it's like you'd poured acid in there on it i don't know if it's been in an attic somewhere and and gone through a lot of heat and temperature changes just like that black fabric that disintegrated in my wash so if it had what do i do with it then you know is it only like something i just fold up kind of pretty and put it on the bottom of a, a little twin guest bed just so it's a conversation piece can it be saved you know of the things that mary mary w kerr then if you go to her website you need to make sure you put the w in mary m-a-r-y w-k-e-r-r -R. of the uh, works that she showed that she had repurposed and created these other quilts i don't think could be wrong but i don't think any of them were applique in the first place so i'm still at a loss but i feel like it's a good time to bring this kind of thing up because if there's people out there it's pretty large some bonnet sue isn't it how, how big are those i have to take a measurement but that's probably a good gosh 18 inch block so how big would this be so it's one two Hang on, I'll do the math quickly. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, it looks to be pretty much a square. Oh, that sunbonnet's in much better shape. See, you could make a pillow out of that. So one of the things that she did is, you know, she made, you know, some mugs. Basically, she took any salvageable part of the quilt and repurposed it into blocks that it, it wasn't originally like if it was originally the drunkard's path well it became dots became circles um different things like that and then she would take but she's been collecting vintage quilt tops for you know the 30 some years that she's or 40 some i don't know i forgot how many years she said she's been doing it um so she's got a plethora of things to choose from and she, uh, she was creating quilts that are um a blend of styles and techniques and it just was working beautifully but it's something she can pull off because she has other vintage quilts to, to work with it now i would have to put this along with contemporary fabrics i don't have any fabrics that are from uh, anything earlier than the, the 90s i do have some from the 90s and because that black fabric disintegrated i'm worried about washing what i do have left um, i have a quilt that i had been working on that i have I had hand quilted and hand, I had machine sewn, but hand quilted. And, um, you know, I'm probably never going to touch it again. So I'm afraid I, it would be wasted effort because it would all fall apart. I did just see this batting. I thought y'all might be interested in it someplace in here where I was pulling on it. Yeah. See that? So that's pretty thick. And that's one of the things that they discussed on the show, too was that um how to tell what's called a southern quilt so just which is interesting to me i did not so i think she's written a book called southern quilts i'll put that on the screen if i remember correctly and she's got the book um quilts of valor and oh gosh what was the other one oh make do or something like that i'll, I'll put it on the screen um so and definitely i get i think you can get them all from amazon and I don't know if the quilt show has them, but um, definitely go to her website and take a look at them there. But one of the things she was saying about what constitutes a, a Southern quilt is that they're thick and which is news to me. There's like five things she said that makes it a, a Southern quilt, but each Southern quilt doesn't have to have all five. I believe that's the way she said that went down. But now that I'm feeling this quilt, and filling this cotton, I um, I get it. You know, I've grown up in the South, and um, my, you know, I used to spend the night at my aunt's house, and she'd put down pallets of quilts 
on the floor and that was quite comfortable. Of course, when you're young, you don't know that you need a 10 inch mattress because <laughs> um, your body is still pliable. So clearly some of this is not salvageable and I need to be okay cutting it up and turning it into something salvageable. Like I said, my friend is one of four children and none of them were, were interested in the quilt. You know, I could um, take pieces of it and um, make something for them or for their ch grandchildren or something like that to just so they say, hey, you've got a little piece of, you know, your great great grandmother. Because some of it's not in too bad a shape. And I think I started down a path earlier and I got sidetracked. Basically, what she was doing, what Mary Kerr was doing, is that she would take a quilt, she'd cut it up, repurpose some of its units. And they may not look like the type of unit that they came from. They may be completely changed to something else. She'd make a quilt from that. And then whatever is left over from that, she'd repurpose further until, have you ever seen anybody eat a rotisserie chicken who just cleans the bone, cleans it right down to the bone? That's what I'm thinking about how she is with quilting. Like if she were to have this, she would repurpose every thread in it pretty much. She would take, start with the big pieces and repurpose that and then, Whatever's left over, repurpose that. And whatever's left over from that project, she repurposes that. Uh, I highly recommend you going and watching the show. You've, you've got to be a member. Um, and that's an annual fee, but it's an inconsequential fee for the amount um, of things that you learn and enjoy by being able to watch their shows. So if you have any thoughts about what to do with Miss Sun Bonnet Sue, I appreciate it. I'd love to know because I'd like to repurpose it. I'd like to uh, take that initiative. And I don't know that my friend or her siblings want any piece of it. So I don't have to think about it in the terms of a gift that I would be giving back to them. I don't have to think of it that way. You know, they all said, yeah, you can give it to your friend. That's fine. The quilt no longer has meaning to them. I don't know if they even knew their great grandmother. Take a look at that. Those points don't line up. And I love it. That was something that Mary Kerr kept on pointing out whenever she was talking about the older quilts. But it did not prevent anybody from loving this thing to threads, right? It was. It didn't matter. It did not matter. We're so worried about precision these days. You know, unless you're building something to go into a show, I wouldn't worry about it. I just wouldn't worry about it. I say that, but I'm a worrier and I like my points to match up because because I want to know that I know how to do it. And I also know that we have better tools available to us today for cutting these things out in the first place. You know, I look at this and I, I know that some woman's hands, and I don't even know her name, she put every stitch in here. She sat probably on a, a standard quilting frame, you know, a wood quilting frame. And maybe she and her um all of 20 of her best quilting friends put it together i don't know maybe all the stitches were not done by her maybe it was a quilting bee kind of thing i don't know but somebody put effort in and i'd like to honor that i just don't know how i can make use of this look see her knots were not hidden can you see that that's a knot her knots shown she didn't know how her knots Something I find interesting by looking at this quilt is the colors that are being used. Because I pretty much guessed it whenever I first saw the quilt, and I did not know the history of the sunbonnet suit at that time, that um, that this was probably the 20s. And and it, just because my gut told me that this color, um, not color scheme, but these fabric colors were available during that era. And there is something to that. Um, don't remember if it was Mary that said it or if I've seen it elsewhere because I've heard, for, oddly enough, I've heard like in the past week, like on YouTube channels and just various people referencing Queen Victoria and the fact that she had this morning session um, after her husband died, like she went into black and it didn't come out of it. And then that was filtered into our culture and in our culture, even here in America. And then at some point, we all got tired of wearing black and um, we started wearing neutrals. So, and so you got more. And some of it, I'm sure, is about, um, and I haven't done my, my research on this part of it, but some of it also probably has to do with the 
the industry itself, you know, and about which dyes can make which fabrics, which fabric colors and, you know, what procedures are used. But we went from a lot of black fabrics and then all of a sudden we didn't want to wear black like Queen Victoria. So black started showing up in our quilts. And that was in the late 1800s. Pretty sure Mary is the one that referenced that. And I think that's interesting. Well, I bet you there's a similar story about why these colors are what you see in the 20s. You know, these patterns and these colors. And I don't know if it's because of the industry. I'm not trying to say that I have the answer to that. I'm just saying that um, there's things like that that we're not even aware of that impacts our history as quilt makers. I mean, you know, what's impacting us now? You know, the fact that we've got a gazillion type of rulers and a gazillion types of notions and, you know, you get a lot more precision, a lot more creativity, too. Uh, you just get a little bit of everything anymore. Like I said, I don't have all the answers, but it is interesting to take a look at all the different ways that quilt making has changed and to pay homage to those who have come before us. There was something I read online that there was some folklore about Sun Bonnet Sioux being some kind of a signal during the Underground Railroad. But I think that was debunked. It has This came about 50 years after the uh, Underground Railroad. So, you know, it had nothing to do with the Underground Railroad. Uh, there's a lot of folklore about quilts and the Underground Railroad, I believe. You know, so maybe I just take that fabric, that sweet little fabric, and reuse that somehow. But then I would need to wash it. Do I go ahead and just wash this whole thing as it is? Maybe take a couple of victory laps around the whole thing so the cotton doesn't come out and that's things like that and then wash it and then take apart whatever doesn't disintegrate in the wash. I don't know. I don't know, but I am curious about what to do. If you have any suggestions, if you've seen anyone take a sun bonnet sue and do something with it, let me know. I've inherited something else too. Let me show you that. Actually, I'm going to leave, leave this quilt up here and I can put it on it. Quilts, quilts, quilts. So this is from my son-in-law's um, grandmother. Yes, grandmother. And she and her husband, you know, well, his grandmother and grandfather have passed recently. And they were cleaning out her, cleaning out her basement. And this made its way to me. So there's, I'm going to have to go through this at some time. Have you ever inherited, this is another question for you then, have you ever inherited stuff like this? What do I do with it? Do you have any recommendation? Do I just, you know, for what I don't need, what should I do with it? I guess maybe contact my guild and find out if there's um, resources for such thing. Maybe take it to the quilt store and see if they have a resource to making it available to people. Because I don't want to hang on to things that I won't use, but there's some... Look, I mean, this is a spinning spool star template. That's an interesting block. Let me show that to you. Also, I wanted to tell you that I did look up in the Barbara Brackman's Encyclopedia of Quilt Blocks to see what it said about Sun Bonnet Sue. It didn't have Sun Bonnet Sue or the Dutch Girl as you see it here because it's only about pieced blocks. So there are a couple of different patterns in Barbara Brackman's uh, in Barbara Brackman's book Encyclopedia uh, for piecing Sun Bonnet Sue, but not this applique. I think it's great that this woman, and again, I never met her, was organized about her quilting. I wanted to bring this up to talk about something. I had said earlier that I am not a um, I have not been doing a good job of keeping, uh, of journaling any of my quilt making. So I changed that. And this is inspiring me to do that. Like she, none of this is her material, but she was organized about it, right? She had all of her stuff inside this three ring binder and she got herself a really big three ring binder to do it with. And that's great to her. And she's got it labeled and everything. Well, she's 10,000 steps ahead of me. So I did, I do everything on, um, on my computer on Excel. And I, so what I did starting with the piece and quilt sampler is I've got a spreadsheet going and I'm, I'm documenting everything that I'm doing there. I've got all my fabrics listed. I'll try to show you what I've got 
Now it's pretty rustic right now. Um, I don't really know what all I should include because I haven't actually seen anyone's quilt journal. I know in the Fat Quarter Shop, you can buy a journal that Kimberly always uses and that looks fantastic, but I don't want to pay for it. No, nothing against it, Kimberly, if you by any chance are watching this video. I um, I just, you know, there's so much to be buying right now when you're a new quilt maker. I'd rather buy something else. I need a new, another wool mat, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So I am doing a better job. So I've got myself set up with an Excel spreadsheet on the on my computer on my laptop so it's real versatile it can go in and out of the uh, studio so i've got myself set up i just need to document it and i really kind of wish that i had done that with the uh jen kingwell pick a petal quilt i don't have all the fabrics listed there that one's so scrappy now the piece in the the piece in quilt sampler one is as well it's pretty pretty scrappy but not as much so as the pick a pedal since i got the light and the camera set up in here i'm going to go ahead and get the blockheads block 16 and bring that here to this spot instead of moving all this stuff so hang on okay i i um i second thought the idea of doing this on the floor the lighting there wasn't great anyway so what i have here in front of me i believe let me see if i can figure out how to show this to you there's a small working area here. So basically we have, if you can see here, we've got a star inside of a star. And this is block 16 of Blockheads 5 Group 2, Joanna Figueroa, uh, Fig Tree and Company. And it's called Double Star because it is a star inside of a star. I don't think I'm a huge fan of how it's laid out right here. I am going to try something a little differently. I just don't like just, of course, they're showing it in black, right? Black and gray and white. And that's going to have a completely different feel than if you put some pretty beautiful fabric there. But I'm going to um, not do this little square right here the same as these points. I'm going to have all my E's, which are the points of the big star, and the same. They will be the same fabric color. And then all my A's, which are this fabric for the points of the small star, they'll be the same my center square of that star will be different but not a um, huge contrast so it's going to be this is going to go into the center just because it's a nice pretty floral and that d is going to be three and a half inches square so you can get enough of a piece of this that'll be a nice pretty um, fussy cut okay so if this is my center square then my points of that star I think would be lovely if it's this so let's put that behind it there okay okay so then what I thought about is okay so if I've got this and I've got these points but I don't want these corner blocks to be the same as the fabrics that are going to be used on these big star points then what do I want to do if I want some contrast from the small star but I don't want it to be uh, dark and heavy I think I might do good by using my cream white dot on cream. So you would have this progression going on here. Doot, doot, doot. Okay. And then what would I use in my E position? I think I'm going from big scale to medium scale to small scale. Why don't we go to no scale? In other words, why don't we use, excuse my fold job, just, okay. Then this is our E points, okay. And then what do we want for our background, our F and our Gs? I think I want a combination of the shoreline background fabric and the men's shirts background fabric that we've been using. I'll be stretching out my use of the men's shirts background fabric if I just use it in the smaller places which I believe would be the G's and then you let the F be the shoreline background so let me just verify that let's see G is a three and a half inch square and F yeah, is a seven and a half and you need four of those so yeah I'll use the G is the men's no well, shirts has an I in it on men's shirts background F has the shoreline background.
Okay, I've put, I've written in everything that I'm gonna be doing so we can look at it. It's, I know it may look like chicken scratch to you guys, but so the background for the small star will be the cream, this white dot on cream. So that'll be in each of these B and C locations. That way this center smaller star is gonna pop and that's gonna be made out of your um, floral print that's on a cream background and then this for the star points. So that makes sense. You've got these two paired up with this nice, lovely, very yummy, creamy, to separate it from everything else. And so then your bigger star points are, do we want this or do we want that to be white or do we want it to be pink? or green even. I, I like the gray just fine, but, and I also very much like using these as my background. So I'm still happy with those. The only thing that I'm questioning is the use of this silver. Now I like the fact that it has no pattern that I like, and but it yet it has color. And it works. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no reason not to use it. Let me look through my stash a little bit. Well, take a look at that. That pink sure does look good there, doesn't it? With this cream separating it, it looks really pretty. But I'm using pink in my block that I'm doing on Saturdays, my block number five. If you watch my show on Saturday, pink is going right here. And yeah, we've got a big block of pink on here and this is gonna be a 12 inch block. So we do have more pink coming. Do we want to continue to use a lot of pink? There's some other colors that we haven't been utilizing. Do we wanna work on that? I could go with another men's shirt. I don't like that at all. Sometimes, you may think it works until you put it down and no, no, no. If I want to go with a contrast that is more saturated instead of staying with this progressively light um, radiation of colors, I could try that. That would be nice. Not as in love with that scale with these. I'm kind of liking going with the, the pink, because, mostly because it doesn't have any design on it. And it looks pretty. Let me see about my taupes first before we give up on options. Okay, I don't have any taupes that I like for this at all. Um, but let's look at the shirts green. Mm, that's looking good with those two. Oh, I like that. I like that. And that interjects more of our blue-green. But if we interject more blue-green, is that then making it harder for us to incorporate the yellow-greens that I've been trying to do a little bit of a force fit with? Hmm. I think I heard the lady who is doing the Moda Fabrics YouTube channel for talking about the different blocks. And I can't remember her name right now. But I think I heard her describing this latest in this latest video that she did, she talked about how to make sure your stripes go the direction you want them to. And that would be good. That would be good to practice. I remember thinking, oh, finally, I'm so glad I watched this. I'm pretty sure it was this latest video. If not, it was the one for block five because I just watched that video too. Sometime in the last couple of days, not today. What do you think? What's your vote? Of course. I'm not doing this until tomorrow because I'm tired and I think it's best not to cut into fabric or make huge decisions when you're tired. So I will call it quits at this point. We have to decide between the green, the pink, the pink is really pretty. Um, you know, we do have, I don't like that. Okay. And we have the gray and silver. It's an option as well. 
I think I like this green. Honestly, right now, I don't know which one to do. I think I might go with the green because I kind of want to challenge myself to make sure I can manage the direction that the stripes go. I think her name is Lisa, the lady who does the presenting of the blockheads on the Moda Fabrics YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure she made it sound very super simple, but like everything else, unless you've done it, you don't have the muscle memory to pull on and I want some muscle memory. I think the stripe would kind of mix things up. It would make some of the other stripes in the quilt already to make sense. And um, that's good. But like I said, it, you know, it it reads more like a blue than a green until you really get up close and look at it. So it, does it make it harder for me to continue to introduce some of the yellow greens? That pink sure is pretty too. And I would not be unhappy with the silver. So I don't know. Don't know. I'm going to sleep on it is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wake up tomorrow with a fresh brain, I think, and I, will, and I will know exactly which one to do. This video is going to show on Monday, the 22nd of April. If all goes well, you should see a video on the 23rd and you'll know which one I picked. Is it pink? Is it striped green? Or is it silver? Cast your votes here. <laughs> all right, my friends, I'm going to call this video done and get you back to your stitching. I had fun kind of reminiscing about the um, vintage quilt that I have from my friends, family, and trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, it's just nice to hold a little bit of history in your hands and think back about the history of the quilt making arts. There's just a lot of things that influenced it. And if we could take the time to study a little bit more about each of those blocks, I think it's kind of intriguing. It adds another layer of depth to what we're doing. Do we have to? No, we don't have to know any history to any of the things that we're doing, but it is fun. Like at first, one of the first things I read was that the quilt block has something to do with the Underground Railroad. Well, there's no way because it didn't exist until 50 years later. You know, just learning those little things, I think that's intriguing. And seeing that quilt book from my son-in-law's grandmother, that's kind of cool. You know, somebody else who was really into her quilt making and she was very organized about it. That's it for now, my friends. We'll see you tomorrow.